Hello, Euro nerds, and welcome to this presentation on how to successfully write a long essay question. This will include a detailed explanation of the six-point rubric in which the LEQ is graded, and it will also provide substantial number of examples on what six, uh, correct thesis statements are, incorrect thesis statements, what is explicit analysis. It's going to include examples for all of that. So please listen carefully, and hopefully this will explain how to write an LEQ. Additionally, as you will find as a title of this rubric here, AP European History and AP US History, the rubric for both uh, Euro and APUSH are the same. So what you learn this year in Euro, you can apply to next year if you take APUSH. So let's go. First, uh, looking at the overall impact of the LEQ on the AP exam, this will explain uh, the percentages and all that fun stuff. So part the first thing you'll do in your AP exam is take 55 stimulus-based multiple choice questions. That is worth 40% of your overall grade on the AP exam. Then you will write three SAQs in 40 minutes, and that is worth in total 20% of your overall score. You then have a short break, water break, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, next section, they actually will combine all of the time from the DBQ and the LEQ into one section. So really it's 60 minutes plus 40 minutes, uh, and it's kind of up to you to figure out that timing yourself. But you have to write two essays, one document-based question essay, which we really won't deal with until actually the second semester, and that's worth a quarter of your overall, overall score. And then what we're going to deal with now, uh, the long essay question, which will be worth 15% of your overall score and you will have 40 minutes to write this timed essay. Uh, the nice thing about the LEQ is they actually give you three prompts from really three different portions of the course, and of course you pick the prompt that you can most successfully answer. But don't worry too much about the timing and all that nitty gritty right now. Uh, we're just focused on how do you write a thesis proof LEQ essay. Moving on. Okay, so um, this I'll kind of let you read this on your own, but overall I do think there's a considerable amount of value on learning how to write uh, a thesis proof essay, which really is what the LEQ is, um, not just for being successful on the AP exam in May, uh, it's just going to make you a stronger analytical evidence-based writer. Uh, I don't care what type of courses you take, whether they're history classes, English classes, heck, even science classes, um, you're going to have argumentation, you're going to contextualize where the prompt is in the overall history, you're going to have evidence-based argumentation, you're going to use that evidence as analysis, and uh, we'll also see a separate level on really good argumentation, which we'll call complex argumentation. So. Uh, first thing we got to look at when you have an LEQ is you need to read the prompt. Like on the AP exam, they give you three separate prompts. Look at all three, read them closely, and figure out what they want you to respond with. If you don't know what the prompt is asking you, don't choose it if it's the AP exam, but if it's like an um, essay outline for me, then you need to seek clarification via the textbook, the notes, or of course with me if you're thoroughly confused. So how do you address the prompt or the task? Uh, so look for key words. Is it saying evaluate, compare, show change over time, or something of those notes? I like to underline the key uh, verbs in these prompts. Uh, additionally, uh, there are a certain number of examples you have to use. Sometimes they will tell you use at least two or three different kings or countries in your response. Um, pretty much all of our essays, you will in fact take a position. If you don't clearly take a position, they can't award you uh, the thesis point. And I just mentioned this, make sure you know what type of essay you're going to be writing. Is it a compare contrast essay? Is it a causation cause effect essay? Or is it a continuity and change over time essay? And I have three examples here on the right hand side of the screen that you can read on your own. Uh, if this is an at-home uh, like essay prompt, whether it's an LEQ outline or a full L uh, LEQ that you'll write at home, do research 
in the textbook, in the notes. Use your time uh, that you have to have a bunch of facts that you can use in your essay. If it's a timed essay in 40 minutes, of course, you're going to have limited time to make kind of like a brief outline on your paper before you begin writing. All right, so uh, the way this presentation is structured is I will walk you through each of the six points that are on the LEQ rubric and uh, show you examples of good examples and bad examples, acceptable examples and not acceptable examples. So here we go. All right, first part of the rubric is of course the thesis statement. Uh, as a reader of the AP exam, I can tell you this is the single most important part of the rubric. If you don't have a successful an accurate thesis statement that is historically defensible, has a line of reasoning, the rest of your essay isn't going to really come together. It's going to be very difficult to score really higher than like a two out of six on the rubric if you do not have an acceptable thesis statement. So uh, I have a little acronym for you to keep in mind if thesis writing is still difficult for you. I like to call have, have thesis statements that have PEP. What does PEP mean? Prompts, examples, and a position. For prompts, have you used keywords from the essay prompt or the task? Um, incorporate them, the major ones, into your thesis statement. Examples, do you actually state the major examples you will use in your essay? Historians don't like to guess what you're going to write about. We want to be punched in the face with what examples you're going to use to support your position. So uh, as you've seen already, I'm going to strongly encourage you to use what we call a uh, gray area thesis statements, where you don't only make one argument, you really actually show a main argument, you will ultimately take a side, but you also show like an exception to your argument, maybe even a hole in your argument. There's many ways to look at a gray area, but those are the two most common. Uh, essentially what you're doing is you are showing nuance in history. Um, there are rare cases where history is simply one or the other is often many variables that we need to explain and contend with when writing essays. So for us, uh, the thesis statement is going to be the last section of your conclusion. And as I've already stated in class multiple times, a thesis statement does not need to be one sentence. You can have multiple sentences, make it a nice flowing thesis statement. Uh, I've seen thesis statements, three sentences, sometimes five. I would say if you're writing more than five sentences, then you should probably be more concise. Uh, but make sure that you're including all the prompts in the essay. You're, you have your examples in there. You clearly show a gray area, but ultimately show which side you're taking. Uh, and you probably are going to be doing that in at least probably two sentences in the way that I would structure these essays. But uh, one to three sentences and you're in good shape. Uh, additionally, students always ask me, Mr. Prokash, how do I write a conclusion? I don't know how to start a conclusion. So the reality is, especially in a 40-minute timed essay, uh, you're going to have very little time to write a super good, solid conclusion. So for us, make sure you rewrite your uh, thesis statement in the conclusion. So here's why it's super important. Um, I found as an AP grader, the often students will not write an acceptable thesis statement in their introduction, but the readers are trained to identify, get points for you. We are not there to make your life worse, I promise. Uh, so the first thing we are told to do when we can't find an acceptable thesis statement in the introduction, we immediately flip to the last page of your essay and read the conclusion, and often a student will write a clear six, um, acceptable thesis statement in their conclusion. So think of that, putting a thesis in your conclusion is kind of like a CYA card. If you don't know what a CYA card is, Google it right now. All right, next. So here's the exact wording of the uh, an acceptable thesis statement according to the College Board. A uh, thesis statement provides a richly developed thesis that fully reflects, reflects the given prompt. To earn this point, the thesis must make a claim that responds to the prompt rather than merely restating or rephrasing the prompt. The thesis must contain one or more sentences located in one place, either the introduction 
or the conclusion. So if the reader cannot find a thesis or your thesis does not make a historically defensive, defensible claim or it simply restates the prompt in a different way, they cannot give you the point. You either get the thesis point or you don't. So here are two examples of an unacceptable thesis that does not make a historically defensive claim. Uh, example one, Adolf Hitler was the driving force in Benito Mussolini's rise to power in Spain in the 1920s. First of all, folks, Benito Mussolini didn't rise to power in Spain. It was Italy. So that right there is historically indefensible. It's just historically wrong. So you have to make sure you're accurate with your historical knowledge. Example two, the expansion of Protestantism in Italy was the re direct result of the leadership of Henry VIII as the Pope of, in Avignon during the late 15th century. There's so many things wrong in this statement I can't even begin to start with without really going off. So make sure you're actually using correct historically defensible history. You can't just make it up, folks. All right. Uh, additionally, what you can't do, restates the prompt, so you can't offer just basically a reformatting of the words. You need to show us that you actually know more than what is just simply on the paper. Again, use PEP. Use some parts of the prompt, use examples, and of course, take a position. Okay, let's see examples of unacceptable thesis statement and example of good thesis statement. Okay, so here is a thesis statement that would not earn the point on the rubric. War is an unfortunate part of history. Too many people die. Humans should stop fighting. So uh, you'll sometimes see this as a comment to some of your LEQ outlines, things like this. You know, like there's, we obviously writing history is opinionated, but like this type of opinion is really not what we're looking for. Obviously war is awful and should stop. That's not, but that's not why we should study history. We look at causes, we look at effects, we look at the whys, the hows, right? So now let's look at a much more detailed thesis statement that has examples, it's going to take a position, it's going to have that line of reasoning, and of course it's historically defensible. Although religious tension between Protestants and Catholics in Bohemia was the main reason for the start of the Thirty Years' War, dynastic ambition quickly surpassed religion as the driving force of the war. So I have my counter argument, excellent. And then I show I'm taking a position. Dynastic ambition is really the reason why this war started. Now let's see what my examples are. Spain, France, Sweden, and the Holy Roman Empire all sought to increase their power at the expense of their longtime enemies. In particular, this can be seen in France, a predominantly Catholic country, entering the war on the side of the Protestants in order to weaken Habsburg Spain and the Habsburg-controlled Holy Roman Empire. That is what we're looking for. All right, so same prompt, additional examples of acceptable and unacceptable thesis statements. Of course, the task prompt is up above here that you can read. All right, unacceptable first. Religious rivalries and dynastic ambitions shaped the course of the Thirty Years' War. What this person did here is simply reword the prompt. If you find yourself saying blah, 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 impacted, blah, 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 you're wrong. It's not, that is, does not have example, that does not actually state a position, uh, this is, that is not an acceptable thesis statement. And now, of course, let's look at a detailed, acceptable thesis statement. The course of the Thirty Years' War was driven by both religious rivalries and dynastic ambitions. Religiously, there were tensions between Catholics and Protestants. At the same time, dynastic ambitions fueled conflict. Spain wanted to regain control in the Netherlands in hopes of increasing its own power. France sought to weaken the Holy Roman Empire. In addition, Sweden wanted to take control of the grain trade in the Baltic, while the Holy Roman Emperor hoped to centralize power around his crown. Although both religious rivalries and ambitions were important factors, dynastic ambitions were the overriding force that shaped the course of the Thirty Years' War. Is this a wordy thesis statement? Yeah, I think it is actually, but it is definitely acceptable. And as you can see, I'm not completely married to that gray area thesis template uh, you guys are doing on your LEQ outline, but I really do like that template as a starting point, especially in the beginning of the year. Eventually, I would love to see you guys um, go beyond that and start writing more unique thesis statements. But for now, I probably would say stick with that gray area thesis template. Okay, different prompt this time. Uh, this might look familiar from one of your study guides. So the prompt is, when compared to the Middle Ages, how did the Italian Renaissance humanism transform ideas about the individual's role in society? 
So unacceptable example, the Renaissance was a better time for individuals than in the Middle Ages. That tells me practically nothing about either the Middle Ages or the Renaissance. And it's also very, like, very opinionated. It's not really what they're asking whatsoever. Okay, acceptable thesis statement. Again, it's going to be a bit wordy, but it's fine for this purpose. The Middle Ages was a time period focused on religious devotion, a contemplative existence and social tradition, and individuals were viewed as weak, sinful, and at God's mercy. Although medieval values such as the importance of religion in Italian society will persist, that's the counter-argument, the obsession with those values were challenged during the Renaissance when humanism unfolded as a new transformative force in society. Now let's see where the examples are. Humanism valued life on Earth, looked to Greco-Roman culture for inspiration, saw human beings as the shapers of their own destinies. The architecture of Brutaleschi, the writing of Castiglione, and the civic initiatives of Isabella d'Este are examples of how uh, humanism transformed a religiously-based medieval world into a more individualistic society during the Italian Renaissance. Beautiful. Okay, same prompt. Unacceptable response. Humanism transformed individuals such as Michelangelo, Machiavelli, and Rembrandt during the Italian Renaissance. Well, first, this is actually one example is not correct. Rembrandt uh, was an artist during the Dutch Golden Age, really Dutch Baroque, and that's actually the 1600s, not the Italian Renaissance. Uh, additionally, this first part, yes, Michelangelo and Machiavelli were part of the Renaissance, but this is an example of when someone is just rewording the prompt. They're not actually answering the prompt with a historically defensible claim. So they're just saying humanism transformed the individuals such as Michelangelo and Machiavelli. That does not work. It doesn't actually show what you know. Oops, sorry. All right, acceptable. Although the values of Christian, religious duty, personal humility, and social obligation from the Middle Ages blurred into the Renaissance, there is your counter-argument, it is clear that, now we're going to see main argument, that they began to fade in importance when society was transformed in the Italian Renaissance by the rebirth and adaptation of humanism from classical Europe. Italian Renaissance humanism led to political, economic, cultural ideas that changed how individuals viewed themselves and their role in society. Political theories such as Machiavelli argued the government decisions should be based on amoral realism and not theology, while some individuals such as the Medici family often made decisions that were based on economic self-interest than religious duties. Likewise, artists such as Ghiberti were just as interested in human anatomy and demonstrating talent as they were faith. Humanism in the Italian Renaissance played a major part in transforming ideas about the individual's role in society. Again, is it wordy? Yes. Does it work? Yes. All right, next part, contextualization. Contextualization for us is also going to be located in the introduction. So for our essays in AP Euro and probably ACOSH as well next year, you're going to have two parts of the rubric in your intro. You're going to start your introduction with contextualizing the prompt, and then you're going to end your introduction, introduction sorry, uh, with a thesis statement. So what is contextualizing in AP history classes? Well, here is what it means. Properly situates the argument by explaining the broader historical events developments or processes immediately relevant to the prompt. To earn this point, the response must relate to the topic of the prompt to broader historical events, developments, or processes that occur before, before during, and or continue after the time frame of the question. This point is not awarded for merely a phrase or reference. Okay. I, I'm going to tell you right now, very, very few students contextualize when talking about history like after the event you're supposed to talk about and during, I would tell you ignore these two parts. Contextualize by talking what, about what's going on before the prompt is taking place that affect the prompt. It is much, much easier to do that correctly than these two. Just don't try it. Just don't. <laughs> okay, so uh, here are some additional notes on contextualization. So sets the stage for your argument or, and or seats the argument in a place historically so the reader has a general idea of the historical background to your argument offers a general overview of the time period. What events are taking place before the prompt that make your prompt happen? That's kind of like the layman's version of that. Uh, additionally, it needs to be relevant. So example, 
For example, if one is writing about the Italian Renaissance, one cannot use the Neolithic Revolution as contextualization. So you can't go back for like 5,000 years, folks. It has to be immediately relevant to the prompt. Uh, additionally, the contextualization, you pretty much can't do it correctly unless it's like three sentences-ish in length. Sometimes you can do it in two. I think three is actually a nice sweet spot. Five sentences, I think you're getting a little carried away. And also in a timed essay, you might not want to waste extra time like that, right? So I think three sentences to do contextualization correctly. It needs specific evidence. It cannot be super generalized. Um, this is actually a kind of a tough point to get on the rubric because students talk too general and they don't have enough specific information. So again, my recommendation is this should be really the very first thing you write in your introduction. Uh, then you hit me with your thesis statement. Some students do hold off with contextualization and they write it as a separate body paragraph immediately after the introduction. You can do that. Um, it is just my personal preference as a reader, as an AP teacher, uh, that you put it before your thesis statement. Okay, so we'll have a few examples here. So again, the same prompt, we're talking about the impact of Italian Renaissance humanism on the role of the individual in society. So in this fuchsia, pink, purple, I don't know what color this is, uh, is going to be your contextualization, and then in red, is the thesis statement, which I'll let you read under it. In the aftermath of the Black Death and in the late Middle Ages, the Italian Renaissance slowly emerged and then dynamically developed in Europe. It lasted from approximately 1400 to 1550. Some of the most famous names in European history were uh, part of the period Donatello, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, Machiavelli, Brunelleschi, Ghiberti, Isabel d'Este, Pulcilius II, the Medici, and many others. Uh, the Italian Renaissance saw a rebirth of classical values from ancient Greece and Rome, ones that would largely that had been largely dormant during the Middle Ages. Life in the Middle Ages had been centered on Christianity, social obligation, and personal humility. And that right there is setting up the thesis statement so well. So as you can see, this contextualization has specific examples in it. Okay, uh, next part of the rubric is the evidence section. And this is where you can get either one point or two points. So let's see what the difference is. So here's where you get no points. You lack evidential support for an argument and or provides evidence that is not re relevant to the stated prompt. So the prompt is about Italian humanism and all of a sudden you start talking about Benito Mussolini in the 1920s. That evidence, it could be correct, but it's not applicable to the prompt. We can't count it. Uh, one point. You address the topic of the question with specific examples of relevant evidence, but either it's not enough or it does not actually support an argument. So if it's something about Italian humanism, you can list specific examples about Machiavelli and the prince and Michelangelo and his Pieta. You will get one point if you're not, you, if, if you're not using it to actually support an argument. Basically, if you're just listing facts that don't have much argumentation in them, you're likely to get one point, not two. Now let's see how you actually get the two points here in this section of the rubric. It utilizes, utilizes specific examples of evidence to fully and effectively substantiate the stated thesis. So you need to have enough evidence. For us, you're looking at at least two to three major pieces of evidence to get here. If you only have one, they're probably not gonna give you two points. Uh, or have a relevant argument. Uh, explicit linkage between evidence and argument is consistent throughout the essay. Uh, you don't make the reader think about why you're using this piece of evidence. You're thoroughly explaining the connection between your evidence and your thesis statement. Okay, then you have analysis and read, uh, reasoning in the LEQ. So this part is directly related to the historical thinking skills that the college board thinks you need to know. So uh, all the essays in uh, AP Euro and in A Push are based on these three historical thinking skills. The essay will be either a comparison essay, a causation essay like cause effect, and continuity and change over time, CCOT. And you need to effectively use those historical thinking skills to get this point. If it's not clear that you're comparing and contrasting, that you're showing cause and effect, or showing what stays the same and continues over time, you cannot get this point. In short, 
you need to use this explicit analysis and you're going to be provided a bunch of examples of what explicit analysis looks like and also unfortunately what implicit analysis looks like which is not what we are going for all right so you can read the rest of this on your own um, just a thing of note we are this is the part about analysis i do not want to see personal pronouns i statements any of that in your essay outlines your real essays none of that uh, remove that personal stuff from your formal writing uh, all right. Oh, I got to talk about this part here. All right. So this, this next section is really important. Students always ask me, Mr. Prokash, where do I do analysis? So you can kind of do it this way. So you, if you list a fact, you then need to explain why it matters. So that's the way I would do it. You list a fact, explain why it matters. How does it support your evidence? Some students might list two facts, describe them, and then they will show the analysis, uh, explain how it supports their thesis statement. Now let's look at an example of implicit analysis and explicit analysis of course we want the latter so the prompt you can read on your own it's about the Thirty years war we have our thesis statement which again you can read on your own so here we're going to see an example of they're going to describe the history which you need to do and then the student is like just about to analyze and then kind of stops so Gustavus Adolphus, the king of Sweden, was a devout Protestant that often required his troops to sing Lutheran hymns as they marched. He was greatly concerned about the Ferdinand Habsburg's campaign of forcibly converting Protestants to Catholicism in the northern states of the Holy Roman Empire. That wasn't the only reason, however, Adolphus became involved in the Thirty Years' War. He also wanted to seize control of the profitable grain trade in the Baltic. In fact, Gustavus Adolphus even tried to blah, blah, blah. So right there, he was just about to get to the analysis and then stopped. So let's look at my comment. Please note here how the analysis is implicit. The writer uh, leaves it to the reader to make the connection between the evidence and thesis. Indeed, the reader has to recognize that the evidence provided are examples of religious rivalries and dynastic ambitions. The onus of responsibility, regrettably, falls on the shoulders of the reader. That does not make for a compelling argument. The responsibility is on the writer to explain this case, folks. All right, now let's see if explicit analysis. In this case, it is in this purple fuchsia, whatever color that is, pink maybe, whatever. Uh, Gustavus Adolphus, the king of Sweden, was a devout Protestant that often required his troops to sing Lutheran hymns as they marched. He was greatly concerned about Ferdinand the first campaign of forcibly converting Protestants to Catholicism in the northern states of the Holy Roman Empire. That wasn't the only reason. However, Adolphus became involved in the Thirty Years' War. He also wanted to seize control of the profitable grain trade in the Baltic. So right now, the student has described history, which you need to do. Here we go for the analysis. Therefore, I love this word. It's such a great transition word. It immediately tells the reader, you're about to punch me in the face with analysis. Uh, love, therefore, because can work. Often I'll see students say, this shows. Those are all signifiers that you're about to analyze. Therefore, Adolphus clearly had both religious and dynastic motives for involving Sweden in the Thirty Years' War. So unfortunately, students will stop right there, and they think that's analysis, that one sent that first sentence there. It is not. It is not. You have to keep going. Here we go. He wanted to drive Ferdinand's army back, in part to ensure the Protestants could openly and safely practice their faith in the Holy Roman Empire. Likewise, his desire to expand his empire in the Baltic region so that Sweden could seize control of the profit-generating grade trade uh, flowing from Poland illustrates a dynastic ambition for the Swedish House of Vasa. Uh, more wealth and power for Adolphus is clearly a dynastic ambition. Nice. Indeed, dynastic goals were more important to Adolphus than religion. That last part here like ties it all together. It goes back to the thesis statement that dynastic ambitions trumped uh, religious and rivalries during the Third Years' War. That is beautiful. Okay, so right now we've covered five points out of six. I will tell you, as a reader and a person who's taught AP Hero for a while, if you get five out of six points on the rubric, you are doing so well. So students who will get like five out of six on the LEQ rubric, they're looking at probably a five, at least a four. So be extremely happy if you're getting a five out of six on a timed 40 minute essay, folks. Uh, the reason I emphasize this is Every year I've taught this, students get so obsessed with this very last point on the rubric. It's called the complexity of argument. This gets you to that magical six out of six. It is extremely difficult to get 
this point. To give you an idea, uh, on average every year, in the entire 110,000 students who will take the AP Euro exam, approximately five to seven percent will get the complexity point on the LEQ. It's also on the DBQ as well. So do not become so obsessed with this, getting this point here that you lose sight of the rest of the essay. Um, it is definitely not the end all be all. Again, I am so happy if you can get a five out of six on this essay. So this is just like the cream of the crop. This like ties it all together. This like knocks the socks off the reader's feet is kind of what this point is. Some uh, people will call it the unicorn point because it's so rare to achieve. Okay, uh, so the complexity point you can earn in multiple ways. Uh, again, you can attempt it it's unlikely you will get it, statistically speaking, okay? So um, don't come to me saying, Mr. Progression, I tried it, I didn't get the point, why not? Well, because you probably just didn't do it well enough is the answer. Uh, I'm going to show you the easiest ways to get it, albeit it is still quite difficult. So uh, you can read what the zero uh, means on your own. Here's what it means to actually get the point. You demonstrate a complex understanding of the historical development that is the focus of the prompt using evidence to corroborate, qualify, or modify an argument that addresses the question below. What the heck does that mean? Well, it's all stated for you actually in the rubric, which is kind of nice here. So we're gonna look at each of the examples in the next five slides. Here we go. All right, the first one. Uh, you can achieve this point by explaining both similarity and difference both continuity and change, both causes and effects. Uh, so the thing is though, you need to do it often and well and detailed. So like if you don't get the point, it's probably just because it did not pass that threshold of enough stuff. So once again, you're gonna see a detailed explanation um, of rena examples of Renaissance art, in this case mostly about Lorenzo Ghiberti and comparing it to middle-aged art. So here we go. Let's see what the complexity of argument is. And additionally, what you see in red, this will have been done in other parts of the essay, not just this one portion, okay? Uh, and this would actually probably be too short if it was just this one statement in the entire paper. Of course, there was some continuity between the two periods, Middle Ages and Renaissance. After all, both medieval artists and Ghiberti were paid to create religious works depicting scenes from the Bible. They, uh, there were stories they, that mattered both to church leaders and to the faithful. The biblical stories that were shared through art were meant to teach and inspire. Christianity was being valued and celebrated at some level in both works of art and in both time periods. So here they're showing a similarity, right? Uh, still, compared to the Middle Ages, humanism had changed the role of the individual in the Italian Renaissance. So that's reminding me of the main argument there. So assuming the student did this form of analysis in multiple parts of the essay, they could get the complexity point. Next one is the qualifies or modifies uh, portion of, the, of the, the point here. And I will tell you, this one is extremely difficult to use. Uh, I would say only the top, top, top notch students really can do this well. It talks about the different forms of historiography which frankly, a lot of people don't even look at until late undergrad and grad school in history. It's really tough to do. So my recommendation is don't really try it, um, but I will show you regardless what it looks like. So again, this part is pretty substantial. In this case, it, this would be enough to actually get the point in and of itself. So uh, although the argument presented here focuses on traditional political and religious history, a military historian would investigate military strategy, troop movements, weapons, supplies, causality, uh, statistics, and the overall impact of war. On the other hand, a social historian would be more concerned with what the, the conflicts meant to the common people living in those war-torn communities. But it, uh, be it diet, sorry, uh, marriage, status, child-rearing challenges, community organizations, and others. 
Magdeburg, which was sacked and burned, would be of particular interest to a social historian studying the time period. Yet, if one was a Marxist historian, one would interpret the war through the lens of political elites attempting to achieve their goals by exploiting the masses, that is, the common man or women of the 17th century Europe. This was most notable in the vast quantities of blood spilt by the common foot soldier at the time. After all, the Thirty Years' War would be the bloodiest war in European history until the World Wars of the 20th century. Of course, a more traditional historian would counter the Marxist historian by pointing out that Gustavus Adolphus not only led his troops in battle, but he also died. So you have to have an incredible command of history to do this. So I would say don't try it. Uh, I just wanted to show you an example that would work. Now for these next two examples of complexity that I think are the most easily attained for the average sophomore. Uh, to me, this one and the next slide are pretty much the same. There's slight nuances or differences, but I think if you kind of do both at the same time accidentally, which happens. So um, this is the reason I have you guys do counter arguments in your LEQ outlines and of course your real essays. You're basically showing an exception to your main argument. And as you can see, it is this exception is well argued, it's well thought out, it has a bunch of details. So uh, basically what the students here is doing is they argue that humanism is in fact transforming individual society. Uh, but then uh, they're showing a major exception to this growing humanism, this growing secularization by using Savonarola, a Catholic friar who basically takes over Florence and makes it illegal to have any form of fun essentially. Uh, I'll let you read all of this on your own in detail, but this is a substantial uh, counter argument that's excellent. It shows that exception to my rule of the generalization you're making in the main argument, and this would absolutely get the complexity of argument point. So this is really why I have you guys do the counter arguments is to get this last uh, point on the rubric if you're so attempting it. So this would be excellent if you could do this. Then uh, similar is this explains nuance by analyzing multiple variables. So you're showing multiple examples of why things were frankly a thing. Uh, so here we have the red. Same prompt, by the way. Uh, of course, the Medici did not see themselves as secular humanists. They believed they were doing God's work, using their wealth and influence for the greater good. For example, Cosimo de' Medici, one of the most powerful of the banking clan, dug into the Medici coffers to commission Filippo Brunelleschi's uh, to construct the dome on the Basilica in Florence, a church that had been decades through roofless. Cosimo de' Medici, the prophet from usury, had been invested in his faith that had made it so that everyone in the religious community could finally worship in a building that was protected from the elements. Whatever the justification, however, it was infinitely clear that Italian Renaissance humanism had transformed the role of the individual in society. So this is kind of talking about like the Medici like using secularism, but also they clearly still have a religious purpose in their patronage of the arts. But once again, as you can see in that last sentence, the student is clearly taking aside that Renaissance humanism did in fact change or transform Italian Renaissance society. So again, uh, it's very slight differences between this nuance portion and the showing multiple perspectives one. Um, to me, kind of do one and the other at the same time. So uh, what else we got? Oh, historical comparisons. Forgot about that one. So here we go. Uh, the historical comparisons. This one's really tough uh, because it's doing historical comparisons over time. So I also discourage most students from using this complexity argumentation version. Um, basically what you can do is like you're talking about this portion of history but then you can kind of like skip to another period like a hundred years later or something like that and show a similarity. It, uh, from, as a historian, oh, maybe mini historian I guess, it, it just kind of leads to bad writing. Like if you're talking about the French Revolution and all of a sudden you're talking about the Russian Revolution in 1917, it just kind of sounds weird. It leaves like a bad taste in the reader's mouth. I don't know. But regardless, the college board thinks it could be a useful form of argumentation. So I wanted to show it to you. Um, again, I would tell you don't do it. It just leads to a kind of a disparate essay. So I'll let you read it on your own. Um, but once again, I, I would say don't use it. Just don't. All right. So to sum this all up, uh, this rubric is worth six points. The College Board has this crazy matrix in how they eventually give you your score out of five on the overall AP exam. 
here's my conversion um, when it comes to actually writing the essay in class or at home, whatever it might be. So imagine these are a, this is a percentage grading. So sometimes I might not have a hundred point essay. It might be a 50 point essay, just depends on variables. Um, so if you get a six out of six, that's a hundred percent. You get a five out of six, that's a 94%. So if whatever per points I give you, it'll be 94% of those points. You get a four out of six, it's an 88%. You get a three out of six, it's an 80%. Wait, three out of six, that sounds like a 50%. No, it's not. Um, the college board knows that you're like 15 and 16 years old taking this course. We have effectively added in like a curve to the essay. So if you ask me to curve your grades, my answer is they're already curved, <laughs> so especially on the essays. So if you get a three out of six, which I think is actually a really solid start to um, AP, you get an 80%. You get a two out of six, you're still passing, 72%. You get a one out of six, it's a 60%. If you get a zero out of six and you at least wrote something, I'll give you a 50. If you don't write me an essay or it's something ridiculous, um, then you'll be a zero. I can tell you as an AP grader, I have read some hilariously bad things because clearly the student had no idea how to write the prompt. So they, they've given me outstanding workout plans. Um, I've had marriage propositions because their teacher went through a horrible divorce and they're looking to set her up or something like that. Uh, but yeah, just write me an essay. You'll get something here, folks, uh, as long as it's not about those aforementioned activities. So yeah. All right, next. Almost done. So organization. So uh, the... The AP rubric does not grade you on organization, but this is not just a class on how to do well on the AP exam. This is a class on how to become a better writer, how to become a better analytical thinker, a little mini historian, whatever you want. So please try and actually have an organized essay. Overall, our LAQs, especially the in-class LAQs, they're probably going to be five paragraphs, one introduction, three body paragraphs-ish. Uh, and one conclusion. So I want to see a well-organized body paragraph that has topic sentences, right? All right, because it's just good writing, gets in a good habit. So mechanics style proofing, again, is it explicitly evaluated on the rubric? No, but it also makes your essay easier to read. It also shows the AP readers that like you have a grasp of historical writing, and it's just those little minute things that can in fact make a difference. But regardless, a, us AP readers, we know that this is a first draft. We're not explicitly um, grading you on that mechanics and stuff like that. It just makes it better in the end, I think, for the rubric. But like, it, we're not explicitly grading you. Like, we're there to try and help you get points. Remember that we really are there to help you succeed. Promise. So. Here's a general list of things that you should either do or don't do. Uh, I'll just tell you my pet peeves. I cannot stand when people don't capitalize proper nouns. I understand we're in the autocorrect generation of iMessage, but it has destroyed <laughs> some students' ability to understand what proper nouns are. So if you're talking about the Italian Renaissance, capitalize the Italian Renaissance. Capitalize the name Cosimo de' Medici. Uh, capitalizing makes sense. It makes it pretty. Just do it. It's good. Uh, eliminate colloquialisms. So like if it's slang, if it's like regular everyday conversation you have with your friends, it's not appropriate for formal writing. Just don't do it. Um, please try and be conscientious when you're using these kind of basic words, things, a lot. Um, you can insert different words for them. Be more specific in your writing. Be more explicit, right? Uh, eliminate contractions. So an example of a contraction is don't, won't. Uh, so say, do not, will not. Uh, it's just a form of formal writing. Refrain from using those contractions in your writing. When you're speaking, that's fair enough, but writing, you want to not use them. Uh, fragments, run-ons, try and not do them. It is what it is. Uh, another one, yeah, Roman numerals matter in this course. So it is just one of those things where like, you, the reader can tell if you have a good grasp of history. When I see someone literally write out Louis XIV like this, just a part of me dies. So you got to have a basic understanding of your Roman numerals. Um, basically, if you know your Roman numerals up to like 20, then you're in solid shape for this course. I promise I won't make you know all 18 Louis in France. I promise. Some of them, though. No. All right. Uh, what else? What else? Cite your sources, if, especially if it's um, an out-of-class essay. Other than that, if you're confused about anything, come talk to me. I like talking about writing. It's fun. All right. Uh, let's see. Final thoughts. 
So I've mentioned this in class about double dipping. Uh, unfortunately, if you use one piece of evidence in one part of your essay, it can't be reused and count for multiple points. Best example I see, students will use um, evidence in their contextualization and then they'll reuse it in their body paragraph and expect the reader to count it. We cannot. We can only count it for your complexity, your, uh, sorry, your contextualization or an evidence. Uh, again, I will tell you the reader will give you the point where it matters the most. So they will like shuffle it into a section that'll give you the most points. We, again, we are there to try and give you points if it's there, but make it easier for the reader to differentiate points. Is there partial credit on the LAQ? No. Um, you either get the point or you don't. That's it. You either get the point or you don't. Honestly, that's kind of how most of the AP exam is graded. Uh, let's see. So can you succeed? The answer is yes. Are you going to succeed the first time? Probably not. It's okay if you get a one out of six, two out of six on your first essay or the first few essays. That's okay. It's going to take you time. It's going to require resistance. It's going to require thoughtfully engaging with the criticism I give you. Um, is it going to sometimes hurt a little bit? Yeah, but that's ultimately how you will grow stronger as an analytical thinker and as a writer. So in short, there have been thousands of students who have been successful in AP Euro, thousands since 1983, uh, and you will be one of them. It's just a matter often of patience, hard work, accepting that criticism and be willing to adjust your writing to achieve these elevated standards. So thank you for listening. There's a weird bitmoji of me looking like a penguin. Uh, if you have additional questions, I'll be happy to answer them in class. Uh, feel free, of course, to re-listen to any part of this presentation. And I definitely would actually keep this presentation in a safe place because I think it could be useful. Uh, later down the road, even in May push next year, what have you. So thanks for listening. Have a good one. Ciao.